Okay, let's give it a few seconds just so we can check if we are live. Let me check here. Yes, so we are live. All so right. good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Luan Gezi. I'm a professor at Valongo Observatory of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And we are here for uh, our weekly colloquia. And today we have the great pleasure of having Professor Konstantin Batigin. So I'll say a little bit about uh, his career. So Forbes named Professor Konstantin Batigin the next physics rock star in its 2015 list of 30 under 30 young scientists who are changing the world. And he received his bachelor's degree in physics from University of California, Santa Cruz in 2018 before pursuing graduate studies, studies at California Institute of Technology, famous Caltech. So to date, Batigin has authored over 80 scientific publications and his research has been featured on the front cover of Scientific American. Prior to joining the faculty at California Institute of Technology in 2014, Batigin was a postdoctoral scholar at Observatory Côte de l'Azur in Nice, France and Harvard University. And when not doing science, he enjoys playing uh, in his rock band, The Seventh Season. So, Constantine, it's a really great pleasure to have you here. We are ha very happy that you ac accepted our invitation. So, please feel free to go ahead and let us know uh, more about the formation of Jupiter satellites. And I guess that you promised that, that you give us a, a, a very quick update on the status of Planet Nine, right? So welcome, right. To, right. <laughs> so welcome to our talk and the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks very much, Luan. It's a real, it's a real, you know, great pleasure to, uh, you know, be be talking to you guys today. Of course, you know, in a more ideal situation, you know, I always wanted to visit Rio, but you know, say la vie, and uh, you know, hopefully in the future. Um, so, as uh, as Luan said, first uh, the first step here will be to give you guys a quick status update. On, uh, on the search and on kind of the ongoing effort to both understand from a theoretical point of view and uh, you know, observationally detect a new planet in the solar system. And to give a bit of background on why we even think there should be an object, a massive object lurking in the distant solar system, we have to go back uh, maybe 20, 30 years um, to a time when when large-scale discovery of objects beyond Neptune was new. So here we, we're seeing a top-down view of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in blue. That's the orbit of Pluto. Okay, And really, uh, before 1991 or 1992 or so, Pluto was, of course, uh, taken as the outer edge of the solar system. Today, we know that's not true. Today, we know that Pluto is just one of the bigger Kuiper Belt objects, of which there are now uh, thousands with well-characterized uh, detected orbits. Um, and so this, this notion that um, the, the solar system doesn't end at Pluto, and there's a whole this, all these icy asteroids, if you will, in the trans-Neptunian region, has caused a large-scale rethinking both of the cardinal markup of the solar system as well as the narrative of how the solar system formed. And now, um, this really has been a revolution that, that took off in the mid-2000s through a sequence of papers written by um, a group that were all working in Nice at the time, uh, Siganis et al., Gomez et al., Morbidelli et al., and basically the, the story proposed for the formation of the Kuiper Belt, this field of icy debris beyond Neptune, is shown here. This is uh, one of our simulations from about a decade ago where the solar system starts out in a compact configuration, and then driven by interactions with a um, massive field of icy debris, right? The planets undergo an instability 
and kind of their orbits expand. And as that happens, the uh, icy debris gets ejected. And although 99.9% of them indeed leave the solar system, a fraction of them remain. So again, this was a pro uh, story proposed by a group in Nice. I did a bunch of work on this model as a graduate student back about 10 years ago um, to understand the structure of, of the Kuiper belt. I think at this point, it's quite clear that this narrative is at the very least on the right track and more uh, likely is probably just, just right. So that kind of tells you why the uh, outer solar system beyond Neptune has stuff in it. Um, what we discovered in 2016, however, is that if you focus on the most distant of these objects, right, the most distant members of the Kuiper belt that we know of today, their orbits exhibit an unexpected degree of alignment. And if you kind of, you can see this in this in this little movie, right? As you turn them around, they all kind of lie in a common plane, which is about 20 degrees inclined with respect to the plane of the solar system. And all of the orbits uh, that were known at the time all kind of point into the same direction. That's anomalous. That's indeed not something you naturally get out of the Nice model type calculation, these calculations of the formation of the Kuiper belt. And this was back in 2016 when uh, we knew of six objects. Um, there have been a multitude of new detections since then. Um, the data set basically doubled and you can see it here. And, and basically the, base, the story remains the same, right? Objects in the distant solar system tend to cluster into a common direction and importantly this clustering is much more pronounced among objects that are dynamically stable so things that are being whipped around by rapid interaction with neptune show less clustering things that are dynamically stable are clustered together very very well okay so we might say okay well what if this is just something that happened early in the solar system's lifetime that aligned the orbits and we're seeing some relic of that, turns out that explanation doesn't work. If you just take the solar system's configuration as it stands today and just let it go, right, on time scale of a few hundred million years, these orbits would process out of alignment. So in other words, something, something is keeping these orbits gravitationally confined in this cluster. Um, in principle, that something can be anything. It can be a big hamburger in the outer solar system, maybe a burrito, it can be a black hole, it can be anything. But uh, we think that the most uh, reasonable explanation for this is an undis as a yet unseen and undiscovered super Earth type planet. Um, and the reason we think uh, so is summarized in this numerical simulation that I'm, uh, that I'm showing you guys right now. Here we are taking the solar system as it formed 4 billion, 4 point something billion years ago in an unstructured state. So all these distant uh, orbits are the orbits of the Kuiper belt and they point every which way. And we, of course, introduce the canonical giant planets as well as uh, planet nine. So the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, you can see them, these, these small uh, pink circles kind of close to the center. The orbit of planet nine is this long pink ellipse. The gold or greenish orbits, I, I apologize, I'm actually quite colorblind, so I can't tell the difference, but these, the bright orbits are the ones that are representative of the closer, more proximate part of the Kuiper belt. The blue orbits are um, the ones that are the distant members of the Kuiper belt. And point is, if you just let the solar system evolve self-consistently in the usual n-body fashion, as time goes on, what you will see is that the gravity of planet nine clears out the orbits that are collinear with its own major axis, while the orbits that are pointing the opposite way, in the opposite direction of planet nine's orbit, those are the ones that survive over long term. So the eccentric orbit 
of Planet Nine, the secular evolution induced upon the distant Kuiper belt by Planet Nine, um, provides a nice explanation for this clustering. Simultaneously, there are other lines of, uh, of evidence which nicely fit into, into the Planet Nine hypothesis, which I don't really have time to go into at the moment. But the point is that the clustering is maybe the easiest one to visualize and the most uh, kind of readily intelligible uh, one out there. So back about a year ago uh, in 2019, we published a, um, an extensive suite of numerical calculations where we you know, tried all kinds of different configurations of planet nines and all kinds of different masses uh, in an effort to zoom in on what we think are the best parameters of this undiscovered super Earth. And we got quite excited because compared to what we thought back in 2016, when we kind of wrote the the first couple papers that uh, we put together on this, um, it actually looks looks better, right? So a planet which is about five Earth masses and on a period of about ten thousand year orbit uh, with a moderate eccentricity and a moderate inclination is actually easier to discover observationally than what we thought back in 2016. So this was uh, this was good news. Uh, or at least so, so we thought. But of course, the the right thing to do the moment you uh, you publish something and you think that you know you're you get excited about it, uh, the right thing to do is to then look back and ask yourself, you know, it, have I uh, have I really understood everything, and is there perhaps a room for improvement? And ultimately. Uh, you know, I think there is room for improvement in this model and this work that I will now describe as unpublished, but it's uh, but it's kind of getting to a coherent story. And it ultimately starts by looking back at the initial conditions. But when I first showed you guys that simulations of the formation of the Kuiper belt, right, one of the key things to note about that calculation is that as far as the simulation was concerned, the solar system is an isolated object. The solar system is the universe, if you will. But that's not really how the solar system formed, right? The sun didn't form alone. It formed in a cluster of stars, um, maybe kind of like this one that I'm showing on the screen here. This is the uh, Orion Nebular Cluster, one of the uh, maybe canonical examples of, of star formation regions. So this begs the question, did the solar system's birth environment play a role in, in shaping the outer solar system that we see today, okay? The reason to suspect that it did is that there's a well-known process for the formation of what we call the inner Oort cloud, okay? So here, when the, uh, it's, it's kind of a summary, a cartoonish summary uh, that we uh, that is outlined in three steps. But basically, as the giant planets form, they eject, they scatter things, they scatter little pieces of debris out to big um, heliocentric distances. And if such, uh, if the solar system is embedded in a cluster, then perturbations from passing stars can detach those uh, orbits of planetesimals from the giant planets. And, and circularize them, creating this almost spherically symmetric cloud of material with an orbital radius of a few thousand astronomical units. Now, if there's no planet nine, uh, then this cloud of material just sits there and doesn't really do anything. But the, if, if planet nine indeed exists, then the gravity of planet nine can re-inject these inner Oort cloud objects back into the observable realm of the Kuiper belt. And this is really work that we've been, we've been doing over the last year or so, trying to understand how this process of not only confining orbits that are coming from the inside out, but also coming from the outside in, how does that change the picture entailed by the planet night hypothesis? How does that change the clustering? And, um, the, the answer is actually quite perhaps uh, readily understandable here on the top plot is what we have for objects 
injected uh, from the outside in where the background density plots is showing uh, showing the results of numerical simulation. The little points are the data. Okay, and on the bottom, this is a figure from the 2019 article, which shows the clustering of objects coming from the inside out. Uh, it is maybe a little bit difficult to see this by eye, but I promise you that the clustering exhibited by objects coming from the inside out, joining the Kuiper belt uh, from interior of, of 30 AU back 4 billion years ago, cluster much better than the objects injected from the outside in uh, over the lifetime of the solar system. This is shown here on this histogram where this is the probability density function of the longitude of uh, perihelion. So this is basically a degree to which things cluster together, right? This black curve, which, which looks kind of like a truncated Gaussian distribution is what you get from the standard model where you say, just say the Kuiper belt as it formed four billion years ago is all there is. And these multicolored curves are the different versions of simulations where material is being injected from the outside. So as you can see, um, this, this process of having Planet Nine pollute the Kuiper belt with material from the inner Oort cloud um, basically introduces an added degree of uncertainty into the Planet Nine model. So if the data is indeed contaminated by these objects, then in order to reproduce the degree of clustering, we need to make Planet Nine's orbit more eccentric than we thought before. And the unfortunate thing about that is if you make the Planet Nine orbit more eccentric, well, it's further away. It is more difficult to observe. So as I said, this is all uh, kind of work uh, that is ongoing and in prep, but I think the uh, kind of takeaway point here is one that I, uh, you know, I think is well stated in the MIT Tech Review uh, article that says just given the level of detail that these models have, it's easy to imagine that, you know, we can point to an area of sky and say, look there, but not so. Finding Planet Nine will likely require a dedicated survey using some of the world's biggest telescopes, and we have been doing this with the Subaru telescope, but uh, one of the things that I have found out personally being, uh, you know, a theorist all the way up until a few years ago, and, you know, I started accompanying you know, Mike, uh, who is the observer of, of the two of us uh, on onto these ob observation runs, is observing is really hard. Things go wrong all the time. So we've covered, I would say, about, uh, you know, 40% maybe of the one sigma error bar of where we think on the sky planet nine is, but a lot of, uh, there's still indeed a lot of room to go. Okay, so I think I want to stop talking about planet nine here uh, and instead uh, pivot back into the uh, kind of inner realms of the solar system. And instead of talking about things that are yet undiscovered, talk about objects which were literally the first, you know, genuine astronomical discovery uh, made immediately upon Galileo's adaptation of the telescope as a scientific tool. And that's the giant planet, uh, the, the Jovian satellites. So the Jovian satellites um, are, are very well known. They've been well known for 400 years. There's four big ones. There's like 60 other small ones of which we won't won't worry about. We'll only worry about the big Galilean satellites. And it's it's a good idea to think about them at this time because we are about to send billions of dollars to to the icy uh, icy satellites of giant planets. Um, in fact, there there are three missions that are supposed to launch just in this decade. NASA is sending a Europa Clipper to Europa. Uh, ESA is sending a mission called JUICE to Ganymede, which is the third and most massive moon of, of Jupiter. There's another NASA mission called Dragonfly, which is going to Titan, which is a moon of Saturn, right? So, so there's a, all this interest uh, in these outer um, planet satellites part it's driven by the search for life and the solar system, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing is clear, right? It's clear that over the next sort of 15 years, we will 
have an unprecedented level of unprecedentedly detailed view of these satellites. At the same time, I would argue that a more basic question remains um, unaddressed, which is why are they there? Okay, why are they? Why do they exist in the first place? Now, of course, I'm not the first person to to ponder the question of why satellites exist. And indeed, there have been some models developed over the last uh, 40 years to, to answer this question. The most classic of them is the so-called minimum mass model dating back to the work of Lunin and Stevenson. And the basic idea there is you say, well, okay, the satellites are like a miniature solar system, right? And so um, they must have formed out of a little disk of material. Uh, and just like the solar system, what you can do is you can kind of grind them up and imagine what is the minimum mass satellite nebula you need to create the satellites. So this was done in the early 80s and revisited um, in, the, in the early 2000s. And the basic idea is, the basic kind of takeaway point is that such a story just does not seem to work. It does not seem to work because the temperatures that you get in such a minimum mass disk are so high that you are you would never form icy satellites. This was, uh, I think, conclusively demonstrated in a recent paper by Miguel and Ida, who turned every parameter possible in this minimum mass model and just concluded that you never get something that looks like the Galilean satellites in in this scenario. So if the minimum mass model is not right, then surely some other model must be right. And the competitor to this model was the so-called gas starved model of the uh, of satellite formation. Now this was introduced by Robin Canop and Bill Ward in 2002. Uh, and the idea behind in this in this picture is that the material doesn't you don't ever really need to have the full budget of gas uh, and dust in the um, in the proto satellite disk. Instead, this uh, this disk is kind of in a continuous cycle of um, of being kind of recycled uh, with, from the parent you know protoplanetary disk. In this picture, what what you have is kind of a tenuous you know, low density nebula around Jupiter, and then um, rocks basically fall into it from the outside, form satellites. The satellites then grow big enough to raise significant wakes in the disk, migrate in and fall onto Jupiter. Okay, and the cycle of, of building a satellite, driving it to the planet, and then it falls onto Jupiter, just continues over and over and over again. And at some point, the gas goes away, Right, you got photo evaporates from the system, and you are left with four. That's the basic picture of the the Canop and Ward scenario. The key element here is that you have a ton of solid material. Right, solid material keeps forming and falling. Um, now, we've made some progress in the last twenty years in understanding how uh, you know circum planetary disks, what circumplanetary disks are supposed to look like. And perhaps most dramatically, last year, there was the first bona fide detection of a circumplanetary disk with, um, you know, real, <laughs> with real uh, VLT slash sphere slash ALMA data. Okay, so here what we're seeing is a picture of the PDS-70 system. The, you see actually this, this inner disk, you see this outer disk, you see a couple planets, okay, which are creatively named PDS-70B and PDS-70C. And um, the key element here is that uh, one of these, uh, one of these um, planets hosts a bona fide disk. Right, and that disk. I believe it's I believe it's planet B, but I can't be too sure. But it's one of them hosts a disk, and and you can see it. So these disks exist, and it begs the question of what do they look like? Well, oh, actually, yeah, it was PDS seventy C that that has it. Um, well, 
to kind of get at what the disk looks like, we can here rely a little bit on numerical simulations. And basically what we find out is that, um, you know, the, the disk is uh, orbiting the planet just like, you know, a protoplanetary disk orbits the star, but the motion of the gas is significantly subkeplarian, right? It trails, it, it orbits not at the Keplerian velocity, but at about 99% of the Keplerian velocity because the gas is pressure supported. The other interesting thing about doing these types of simulations is that they give access to the third dimension, which you can't quite see in these pictures. And what they show, the simulations show, is that the disk is actually fed vertically. So the parent nebula is kind of big, there's a planet, there's a disk, and the way that the disk is fed is material kind of rains down onto the planet from a great height, creating these, this nearly uh, Keplerian system, and then decretes back into the parent nebula. So the disk is in this con continuous cycle of, um, of flow where it's being recycled from, is being created from the parent nebula and then re being recycled back into the parent nebula. This is a very important point to which we will come back again later because I believe this picture, the fact that there is a net outward flow in the disk holds the key to forming the satellites, to understanding why satellites form. Okay, now, if you are a skeptical person, you might say, okay, these are some hydrodynamics simulations, right? I'm not, I don't really like hydrodynamics simulations. I'm not gonna believe them. And you would be, uh, it would be okay to say that, except for the data suggests that this is not all just a theoretical pipe dream. Why? Because again, in a seminal paper last year, authored by Teague and company, this flow of raining down towards the uh, material raining down towards the planet and then decreting was detected. Okay, so this picture is indeed real. And now, um, a friend of mine is a is a great artist and so he drew this beautiful picture of of what um saddle what the circumjovian environment must have really looked like in uh four and a half billion years ago and if you think about this very carefully this is very bad news for for satellite formation this picture where material comes down through this meridional flow from a great height and then decretes back it, at face value it suggests that satellites never form. Why? The reason is that in the parent nebula, right, in the parent protoplanetary disk, all the solid material that's worthwhile to think about, like centimeter, millimeter sized grains, they all settle to the midplane. The only stuff that's suspended high up in the parent disk is tiny. It's kind of 10 micron little particles, right, of which there are very few. So the material that's coming in and making the circumjovian disk is actually very metal poor. They say, okay, well, what about, you know, the metal that does come in? By metal here, I mean really anything heavier than helium as usual, right? So what about solid material that does come in? Okay, what happens to it? Well, it's so tiny that it should just flow out with the decretion flow. Right? because it's tiny particles that are very well coupled to the gas. So if that's the picture, how do you ever make anything in these in these circumjovian, circumplanetary disks, right? So it's a real, real question. So uh, I would argue that these observations from last year raised three very basic problems, three basic questions in satellite formation, which we didn't really appreciate existed. The first of them is how does a sufficient amount of material even get accumulated in the disk to form the satellites? After all, the satellites in total are about 0.02% of a Jupiter mass, right? That's not insignificant. And then even if you solve that problem somehow and you say, okay, somehow you, you have enough solid dust, then the question becomes, how do you form the satellite building blocks? What causes the dust to collapse into um, 
the kind of building bl blocks from which the satellites are then grow and finally how do the satellites grow right what is the mode through which they accrete is it pairwise collisions is it accretion of dust etc cetera, etc cetera. so um in collaboration with my good friend alessandro morbidelli in nice we uh I decided to last year kind of look at this problem basically from scratch and the first step in understanding um, this model is to construct a model circumjovian disk now if you look through astrophysical literature there are thousands of uh papers i mean i think literally thousands of papers written on accretion disks not so many papers written on decretion disks um, but there are some and as it turns out, uh, you know, B stars are a great uh, reference point for constructing models of disks that decrete away from the central object. So we adopted such a model uh, to construct our model nebula. Our model nebula is indeed gives you subkeplerian azimuthal flow, which is about 99% of Keplerian velocity, and importantly, material flows out. Okay, here's a plot of the surface density profile of our model nebula. The, the blue line here shows the, uh, the full solution to the, you know, um, to the equations to, of, to basically the, the standard disk equations. Um, for the purposes of, of this talk, I will just note that the, they give you a power law, roughly speaking, of index minus five over four, which is pretty standard for uh, for typical disk models. And importantly, beyond about a hill radius, uh, sorry, beyond about 0 0.1 hill radius, right? So 10% out to the gravitational reach of, of where Jovian gravity reaches, the temperatures are cold enough for ice to condense. So in this model, we have to build the satellites far away from the planet and they have to then migrate in. Okay, let's solve the first problem. We have our hydrodynamic nebula, okay? What happens if we put some dust in it? Well, the dust evolution equations are well known. You can, they've been you know, known since, I don't know how long, but at least the 80s, a great paper by Mizuno. Uh, nowadays, you can just look them up in any any textbook. And if you assume a nearly circular, almost Keplerian orbit, they look like this, where you have the usual terms plus a drag. Okay, And this drag is shown as this, uh, this these terms that are divided by the frictional time scale, the frictional time scale being the characteristic time needed for dust to couple to the motion of gas. Now, in a typical accretion disk, the solution to these equations just tells you that the dust wants to go at the Keplerian velocity, but the gas is going at the sub-Keplerian velocity, so the dust is always seeing a headwind, so the orbit shrinks. The dust loses energy to the gas, loses angular momentum, and its orbit shrinks. Turns out, in a decretion disk, things are a little bit different. Okay? In fact, in a decretion disk where gas is also slowly moving out in addition to its keplerian or oh, sorry sub keplerian orbit these equations admit an equilibrium okay and in fact you can find a value of the frictional time scale for which dust will stop okay this is perhaps uh the easiest way to explain this is to is to just think through you know, if you're a dust grain and you are trapped in this disk, right? And you want to go at a Keplerian velocity, you're feeling a headwind and you're falling, but also there's a radial updraft, which is at all times replenishing your orbital energy. So for, for a specific range of sizes of, of grains, okay, the dusty component of the disk will basically stop and then just get retained in the nebula. So this is the, the uh, proper solution to those equations accounting for the fact that, uh, accounting for a metallicity effect, which is uh, a subtle point. But the takeaway message that I want to uh, kind of emphasize on this plot is that as small grains come into the, to the circumjovian disk and grow, if they grow 
to a critical size, which turns out to be about a millimeter, they will just get stuck. Okay. And further growth, let's say if you grow to you know a centimeter, will cause them to actually drift inwards, sublimate to a lower radius, and then drift outwards. So we think the the disc is entrained in this cycle of maintaining um, all of the solid material at a size of about you know a millimeter. And as time goes on, this causes the metallicity of the disc to just go up. Okay. So here is a um, you know, little animation of this process. The this is in the center is Jupiter, and um, this sh is showing you the the solid budget of the disc, and you can kind of see it gradually build up over time. So a solid subdisc forms, and and just sits there. Okay, certainly a solid subdisc of dust is not the same as satellites. So how do satellites form? Well. In order to ask, answer that question, we have to first answer the question of how the building blocks form. And in order to understand that, we just have to think through what does that look like, right? If you take a disk, a hydrodynamic disk, and keep pouring dust into it, right, what happens? Well, it's on energetic grounds, it's easy to convince yourself that the, that the dust layer has to um, basically get thinner and thinner and thinner. And that's because the gas is trying to lift the, the dust and keep it puffed up through turbulence. But turbulence only has a finite amount of kinetic energy to give. So once the dust layer gets massive enough, it has no choice but to become thinner and thinner due to the energetic cost of its own weight, if you will. And so we, with this, we derived a simple expression for the aspect ratio of the, uh, of the dust layer, H dust over R, which depends on alpha, which is the turbulence parameter of the disk, and is divided by capital Z, which is the metallicity. Okay, so as the metallicity of the midplane goes up, the entire thing go, collapses and becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, as the dust settles to the midplane, you are forced with the question of, can it do so indefinitely? And of course, the answer is no, right? A disk, a dust disk cannot become infinitely thin. This is well known, it's been known since the 60s. And um, here we actually invoke a result from the early 70s called the goldreich wurt mechanism, which basically proposes that once the disk becomes thin enough, right, it has no choice but to fragment into, into satellite decimals. Now, usually, okay, usually this mechanism is disregarded because there are what are called parasitic Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities that prevent it from working. But as it turns out, in a sufficiently supersolar metallicity disk, that does not pose a problem. So, this is the picture that we have, okay? The, the nebula keeps growing more and more metal rich. As a consequence of that, the disk becomes thinner and thinner, eventually fragments into satellite decimals. And you can show that this happens preferentially beyond 0 0.1 hill radii, where it's cold enough for ice to condense. And the metallicity you need is super solar, but it's not you know, absurdly supersolar. It's sort of, you know, supersolar by a factor of a few times 10, a few, maybe 20, 30, something like that. Okay. Importantly, by the way, the, the recent observations of that PDS-70 disk also suggest that it is absurdly metal rich. So the picture is that this, this, uh, disk of material, right, the disk of, uh, of, of dust eventually collapses into satellite decimals, and this is an animation of that process. Okay, so we have only about five more minutes to form the satellites. The good news is, from here, the picture becomes progressively more clear. Once you form the satellite decimals, okay, then you um, can demonstrate that they don't really continue to accrete dust, but they will accrete by colliding with one another and growing 
um, further. Uh, I'm going to skip this argument here because uh, in interest of time uh, and merely go straight to numerical simulations of this process. So we have done um, a large number, and by large number, I mean, it's not that large, 12 uh, <laughs> numerical simulations where we start uh, the ingredients, oops, I apologize. The ingredients of the simulations are, are listed here on top. N-body gravitational dynamics of all of these satellite decimals. I will introduce a few satellite seeds. Um, the particles in this calculation feel hydrodynamic drag and they know how to interact with the disk through prescribed type one migration and uh, damping formulae. So here's what happens self-consistently, okay? We have this disk of uh, satellite decimals uh, shown with these orange uh, circles here. Very quickly, within just a few, uh, few thousands of years, Io grows in the inner edge of the disk. But once it grows massive enough, it raises significant wakes and then migrates towards Jupiter. It leaves behind a more, uh, more disturbed set of satellite decimals. So it takes a longer time for Io to grow, uh, for, for, sorry, for Europa to grow. But eventually Europa also grows up to uh, something like 97% of its mass. Each time a satellite grows, it messes up the disk, causing the next one to take a longer time to grow. So Ganymede here grows up, the third one grows up in about um, 30,000 years, eventually the migration, the disk-driven migration, brings all of these satellites close to the disk edge, the magnetospheric cavity of the inner edge of uh, the, the Circumjovian Nebula. And at this cavity, the three inner satellites lock into Laplace resonance, right? the, the configuration where for four, four orbits completed by Io, Europa completes two, and Ganymede completes one. There's a neat result here that, um, that we were able to demonstrate, namely that in order for Laplace resonance to uh, lock properly, that migration time scale has to be longer than 20,000 years. That is actually a constraint on the surface density profile of the inner Jovian nebula. And it's pretty cool because if you try to drive the migration too fast, then you run through the, the resonance and the, the satellites collide. And moreover, the fact that in this model, Io forms first, then Europa forms, then Ganymede comes in, that inside out uh, sequence of formation is a veritable requirement. Okay, we also demonstrate in our, in our paper that if that wasn't the case, if you just kind of have them all form at the same time, then again, the assembly of Laplace resonance is, uh, is unsuccessful. Okay, the last thing that remains to be answered is the formation of the final object, Callisto. Now, for Callisto, our picture suggests basically that the formation of Callisto has to wait until the um, dust, uh, sorry, until gas is blown away by photoevaporation and in this picture, the, it basically forms from the final carpet of planetesimals and migrates inward by scattering these planetesimals, which simultaneously explains why Callisto is not in a member of the, uh, of the Laplace resonance and why its migration time scale uh, is long as suggested by, by gravity data. So I am at uh, 11.45 my time, which I believe is 2.45 your time, which is a time to stop and take questions. Um, so I think I'll conclude by just summarizing again this, this fairy tale of a model that we've put together. And I, the reason I say a fairy tale is because I think there's a lot more room here for improvement and there's a lot of room for uh, kind of detailed calculations to be done and we're making progress in that direction. But to again summarize, what we propose is that in the Jovian nebula, in the Circumjovian nebula, a hydrodynamic equilibrium is established because of a balance of subcaplarian as a muthal motion and positive radial motion. 
as a consequence of that of that balance, um, dust of the right size, that right size turns out to be about 0.1 to really you know, few millimeters, that dust can slowly accumulate in the disk until um, the solid subdisk becomes so massive that it gravitationally fragments into sort of 100 kilometer objects. And then these 100 kilometer objects collide, grow the satellites until the satellites are massive enough to strongly interact with the disk. Then they are removed from the feeding zone, migrate all the way to the center. Okay, so I think at this point I will uh, stop talking and take any questions that uh, that might come up. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Constantine. It was uh, an excellent talk and beautiful, beautiful work. So I want to congratulate you and all your collaborators on, on such a, a, a an interesting, uh, su such interesting results and papers that you've published in the, in the recent years. So congratulations, beautiful work. Thanks, thanks so much. It's, uh, you know, warms, you know, I very much appreciate that. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. We had lots of questions here in the chat, so so prepare yourself. Actually, I, 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 I don't know, you, you might want to check later. I think some people even talk to you in Russian, so you might want to check the comments. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's so, one, someone says, uh, good morning, comrade Constantine. But again, oh, <laughs> so, so it's this one, right? So <laughs> some people say, say hi in Russian, so very warm. Okay, so let's try and move for the questions in the order that they were made. So there are a mix of questions about Plant 9 and the, the, the yep. Jovian satellites. So let's go ahead. So this is the first question. It's from Tiago, which, uh, and he's a professor here at Valongo too. So mm -hmm. uh, what, should, yeah. what about Plant 9? Should, should have been scattered out? What is the likely process for, for its formation? Okay, what a great question. Yeah, so this is, a, this is something that, um, you know, indeed is quite a intriguing part of the model. You're, you're absolutely right that such a massive object needs to form closer to the sun. Now, um, simulations by, by Andre Isidoro uh, back from, I don't know, 2015 or so, um, actually sort of got at this very issue before this whole Planet Nine business was uh, was going on. And they were trying to build Uranus and Neptune okay, by having sort of five Earth mass embryos form, then migrate, collide together and form, the, form the, the ice giants. Now, that process is not particularly efficient. So what you end up doing is you end up scattering away a few of these five Earth mass objects. In one of their simulations, because the solar system is in the cluster, as I explained during the, the early part of my talk, right, passing stars are able to circularize some of these objects. And they got something that looks like Planet Nine kind of self-consistently. Is it a likely process? I, I actually think that's where the issue is. It's not, it's a process that depends heavily on the adopted cluster model. And if you just take a random cluster model, it'll be, it'll have chances of success of, I don't know, 10% or, or maybe even less. So, so I think formation of Planet Nine is indeed an open question. I think in situ formation is not very likely. Capture is near impossible because the same stars that drop off the planet, well, the next one comes in and strips it away. So, so there's, there are issues there, uh, but I think scattering out is maybe the most, um, reasonable proposal and and if, if you allow me I'll, I'll, i want to make a comment which is very interesting that this possible planet nine has a five around five earth masses and we are finding uh, lots of super earths and this one kind of planet that we actually don't see in the solar system right Absolutely. now so it would be it's very intriguing that this possible planet nine it, it's on a category that we don't find in the solar system but we find a lot in the exoplanetary systems. Absolutely. I mean, it would be, it would be super cool. I mean, like, you know, 
of course, it's it's important to you know not be religious about one's results and, and kind of be you know um, kind of be doubtful. But I mean, it it would be so cool to detect it observationally because I think this would give us the closest window that we will have for the next you know few decades into understanding what the typical outcome of planet formation in the galaxy looks like. Because it's certainly not Jupiter. Right? Jupiters are quite rare. Um, and yeah, I mean, all I'm saying, Luan, is I'm in complete agreement here. <laughs> yeah, so that that's very cool. So, uh, and actually, you, you've done a great work covering about 40% of the One Sigma region. So yeah, that's well. very, very nice work. And connecting with this observational question, so Tiago also asks, uh, would the NANCE Roman telescope would be a, a good tool for, for searching mm. for Plant 9? Or yeah. any other future instrumentation? As far as as far as uh, future in instrumentation, there is a uh, there is a ready to go answer for this, which is um, which is the Vera Rubin Observatory, right? Wow. Uh, when Vera Rubin Observatory comes online in Chile, that's going to be a complete game changer for this um, for this, you know field because i think we will you know within the first couple of years at the very least double the data set i mean my hope is that they'll just find planet nine and we can move on to the more interesting questions of you know what does it look like does it have satellites you know all the usual um uh, you know tentacles that come out of of the detection but um yeah i think it would be uh you know as far as future instrumentation the future is very bright and it's kind of in the next few years, right? We don't have to wait, you know, 30 years for the next telescope. So it's quite exciting. Very cool. So we will move on with the questions. So if you, if you have to, to leave at any point, please let me know because there are actually lots of questions. So people are really interested in the work. Right. You know, it's it's beautiful. It's about it's about noon. You know, I'm 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 ready to hang out for a okay. long time. <laughs> Cool. So let's move on and move, moving on to the ice, ice satellite formation. So this is a question from Felipe Braga Ribas. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also a Brazilian researcher. Uh, he, he does also some really great work with uh, rings, especially yes. Chariclo. So the question is, uh, what about the scenario of, be, of the satellites being formed from rings? Mm -hmm. So this was proposed for Saturn, but could it work for Jupiter too? Great question. I mean, look, so for Saturn, I actually think that's a great scenario for um, making the small satellites. The, um, the, in particular, the paper that comes to mind is the, is the Creda, Charnot um, and, and company. I, I don't remember all the, all the authors, but I think the, the scenario where the satellites, the small satellites like, uh, you know, Mimas, Enceladus, uh, these things form in the rings and then tidally migrate out is great. But even for Saturn, such a scenario will not work for Titan, right? Titan is too big. And so, again, in for, for Jupiter, we can maybe invoke such a model for, for the little tiny things that are right next to Jupiter, right? They're, they're these, like, I forgot the, uh, I think they're called the Althea group. Right, they're these kind of 10 kilometer little things that are sitting in the rings and are constantly kind of being recycled. For Io, Europa, Ganymede, etc., I think that's not uh, that's not a possibility. I think the the rings would have to be unrealistic. Um, that said, I mean, I haven't you know actually quantitatively looked into this question. I've only assumed that because this only works in the Saturn's case to make sort of 100 kilometer moons that this wouldn't work for 1000 kilometer moons in Jupiter, but you know, maybe something to think about. Oh, thanks. So next, next question is from uh, Marcelo Safin, which is also from Valongo here in Rio. So he's, thank you for the excellent seminar. So circling, circling back to planet nine. So mm -hmm. is the current Currently, no amount of stable TNO aligned orbits really representative. So, are there any good explanations for this alignment? If it is true, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So, of course, the question of statistical 
you know, chance and observational bias is one that must be addressed. Um, the, and it's a difficult one to address because you don't know the efficiency function of every survey out there, right? You don't know where everybody has looked, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one of the ways to go about this is what, you know, the folks at the DAS survey have done, which is they found, I think, four uh, of these objects and they asked themselves the question of with these four, can we tell if, can we tell the difference, you know, in a statistically rigorous way between an aligned configuration and a non-aligned configuration? And basically they say they can't tell the difference. Okay. Maybe not surprising if you only have four objects. The exercise that we did, um, this is a paper that actually Mike led, is to say, okay, we, we have all of these objects and we know their brightness, okay? So simultaneously, we also have a map of all discovered Kuiper Belt objects ever, right? And we know their brightness as well. So we can, for each object, construct a, um, a discoverability map of where, in what configuration could this object have been mm -hmm. discovered and do the exercise that way. So this is not taking each individual survey and saying, what are your biases? What are your biases? This is just saying, you know, Sedna or whatever is over there and it's magnitude 20. And there's another object over there that's magnitude 20. So if Sedna was exactly where that object was, it could have been discovered. Doing that exercise gives you a handle on what the probability of false alarm is. And the joint probability that we are seeing the alignment both in the direction into which the orbits point and the plane, right? The, so the fact that those two things are clustered, um, the, are this, the significance level is 0.2%. So there's sort of a one chance in 500 that all of this is wrong. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a gambling man, but I'll take those chances. <laughs> Thank you. So going back to the uh, the Jovian satellites. Mm -hmm. So uh, Gustavo is also a professor here at Valongo. Mm -hmm. And he was curious about Callisto. So he first asked, how can Callisto fit into the scenario that you were explaining? But you, you tackled this uh, in your talk. So I'm moving on to his next question. So the, the und undifferentiated nature of Callisto. So can you explain this? By, me, by using this model that you are proposing? Right. So this is actually the reason why we propose that Callisto, oh. the formation of Callisto happens after uh, photo evaporation of the, the disk. So the whole cycle of forming um, you know, Io, Europa, Ganymede takes maybe 100,000 years, right? We, in our model, make the assertion, if you will, that Callisto cannot just follow the same the same pattern because other because it would form too fast and then its its interior would be differentiated. So we invoke the following picture basically. We say, okay, circumplanetary disks themselves only tend to form at the very last stages of protoplanetary disk evolution. And this is just something that comes out of numerical simulations that tell you that if the M dot is too big, you basically heat up the planetary envelope. And so you don't have a disk, you just have a giant planetary envelope. It's only at the last stages when the envelope is cold enough that you make the disk. Of course, if it's at the last stages on a time scale of something like, you know, less than a million years, the disk will just get photo evaporate. And then after that happens, you have this carpet of leftover satellite decimals. So in our picture, Callisto forms from that carpet and then migrates very slowly inwards by scattering these satellite decimals. When we solve that problem self-consistently, we get a time scale for formation of 8 million years, okay? And it never reaches the Laplace resonance. So. It's a bit of, I have to say, this is why I call this model a bit of a fairy tale, right? Because there is this invoking of timing. I don't like to invoke timing of anything for, for models. That said, it is true that, you know, there was gas at some point and then there's no gas. So at some point this, this transition has to happen. 
uh, if it happens between the formation of Ganymede and Callisto, then we're in business. Then everything is explained. Everything is self-consistent. But I do, uh, you know, want to point out that that is an assumption that we make in the model. Cool. Thanks. So there are two questions. I'll show them uh, to you. So from Matias Javier Garcia from National Observatory here in Rio too. So, it, but they are basically the same on the same topic. So, so first he wants to know how solar perturbation affect or will affect your simulations, and then he also wants to know if you take into account the Yakovsky effect on in your simulations. So he wants to know about these two effects in the simulation. Right. So I think in this particular set of simulations, um, the the Yarkovsky effect uh, and just generally radiative effects don't matter for the most part because you're sitting in an optically thick gaseous nebula. So you basically the, this this um, the uh, and I'm assuming this refers to the to the uh, to the Jovian satellite formation simulations, not the Planet Nine simulations. But in the uh, in the Jovian satellite formation simulations, right? because you are shielded from from sunlight most of the time i think it it's okay to neglect it now for the formation of callisto you might say okay well actually then there's no gas anymore and the answer is no we haven't taken it into account but in order to matter it needs to act on a time scale faster than the formation time scale which is only a few million years so i think you know, it's something that we should definitely look into quantitatively, but my intuition is that it's okay to neglect this. Okay, I'll go back to to other questions that were made before, but as this one connects well with this explanation, so I'm, I'm sending this question from Adriano, uh, who is also a professor here at Valongo. So what about tidal migration of the satellites? So uh, is it neglected in the formation process in this model? Yes, in the formation process, we basically make the assumption that you know, tidal migration acts on a time scale of billions of years. This whole thing is done on a time scale of 100,000 years, so it doesn't matter. Of course, after the disk goes away, right, then the satellites very much do expand their orbits in this tidal migration as you, you know, as is commonly you know invoked in the literature the difference here is that the the um, laplace resonance is already formed okay so the tidal migration um, is not responsible for the formation of the laplace resonance just responsible for transporting the orbits to their current locations okay and now a very provoking question from Marcela Safin. Could an early IO have been engulfed by Jupiter during the satellite's formation? Hmm. Yeah, um, you know what? So we argue no. And the reason we argue no is because uh, this is some work that I had done in 2018 to kind of estimate what the uh, you know, inner edge of the, the nebula must have been like. We argue that the young Jupiter actually must have had uh, or at least should have had a pretty strong magnetic field. And by that, I mean maybe 500 gauss, maybe even as high as a kilogauss. And in the analogy with the Titori picture, Titori star picture, it's this magnetosphere should have carved out a pretty substantial um, cavity, which would have stopped migration of satellites uh, at the cavity. In fact, we invoke this to build the... Um, to build the Laplace resonance. And if it's not there, then our, if this cavity is not there, if the disk extends all the way down to the surface of Jupiter, then our whole model falls apart because then you are back to the Canop and Ward scenario of having to build a hundred satellites, you know, to capture, to, to see four of them as the gas goes away. And I think that's not a good, um, that's not a good explanation given how hard it is to trap uh, dust in the circumjovian disk in the first place. Great, thanks. So moving on, we have a few questions to go. So Thiago uh, explains first that this is not his field, he's an extragalactic researcher. 
but he is uh, curious about the satellites of rocky planets because they were formed differently. So would this model um, work for something like Mars as well? Uh, yeah, so that's something we've thought about a little bit. And I think, I think no, because um, in order for this model to, to work, Right. Basically, you need to I mean, this model really only works for planets that are giant enough to uh, giant enough to open up big gaps in their protoplanetary disks and clear out their neighborhood. I think Mars was just not doing anything. Right? It was just sitting there. And in fact, it's too, you know, Phobos and, and Demios might be captured carbonaceous asteroids rather than bona fide. Uh, satellite. So I think indeed the rocky planet uh, story, which entirely happens after the gas is gone, right? The moon forming impact, for example, was uh, something like 90 million years after the formation of the sun, right? All of that has to happen, you know, in a way that doesn't invoke any hydrodynamics, um, you know, with hydrogen and helium. So I think it's a very different story. Okay, thanks. So yeah. just just so you see that people are really liking the talk, so have a comment here from Silvio Mello. Congratulate oh. you, you and Morty for the beautiful results. Well, thanks so much. Well, of course, Silvio is a, is a legend, you know. So. Exactly. So uh, we have Christian here too. So from Cordoba, Argentina. Oh. So very really nice talk. Uh, Philippe, Philippe also. Uh, thanking you for the, the talk and the, the work. So, okay, and this is a question that connects with one that I, I wanted to ask. So, and he also is asking about a similar scenario for ultra compact planetary uh -huh. systems. So that's exactly the question that I was going to ask you. So can we use this model to, and to try and understand better the formation of very compact planetary systems about the, around the smallest stars? I mean, I think that, um, so let me, let me answer it this way. When we started this problem with Morbi, uh, the thing we were motivated by uh, was the fact that the kind of orbital periods and the mass ratio of the satellites to the star are very similar to that of super Earth, right? If you just take Kepler systems and jumble them up, right? You know, something like, to 10 to the minus four uh, solar masses is, uh, I'm trying to do this in my head, I won't be able to, but it's, you know, something like 60 Earth masses or something like that. So it's not too different from Kepler system. The story we ended up coming up with, is very different from the standard kind of picture of how people think uh, extrasolar planets form around M dwarfs, et cetera. But Trappist-1 is a different creature, right? That that star is just like, it just barely made it, you know, it yeah. just, it just barely made it into the star category. So it, I think it's entirely possible that the, you know, planets of Trappist one formed like satellites, not like planets. I think that's an entirely plausible scenario. It's a very cool, it's a very interesting scenario too. So, Okay, now we're coming to, to the end. Just a few questions left. So Josue is asking about the Triton, Triton and Pluto systems of Moon. And what are the challenges that you could see for this case? So is this, how does this model connect with these specific cases? Right, okay. So I think the case of Triton is is closer i mean given that it's orbiting in the opposite direction i think the most plausible scenario for that is uh formation through uh, just you know three body capture right so i think triton being a captured uh kuiper belt object is a is kind of a um, a plausible and and likely scenario for the case of pluto i think um again this model is not the right one to think about because of the existence of sharon i mean sharon tells you or sharon is like an american way to say it is i think the the proper way is to say it is Charon. but uh you know the formation of Charon basically insinuates right away that there was a giant impact that formed 
uh, Kron. My intuition is that the small satellites that follow are some byproduct of that uh, giant impact. That said, and I, I've never worked on the formation of plutonium satellites, but I have seen talk uh, talk that Hal Levison gave a few years back where he concluded that, that they do not exist because they they are just impossible to form. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, even though I, I kind of say, well, you know, maybe it's connected to the impact. Um, I don't think that there's a, there's a, at least I'm not aware of a good quantitative model that demonstrates this and gets at the right orbits and stuff. That's very cool. So I think this is the last question. So it's a follow-up question from Thiago. So isn't there Ruben this favor for being the opt optical? Uh, he's talking about the, the, the observation of uh, Planet 9, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, I sure hope it's not it's not disfavored for <laughs> for being in the optical. I mean, it is true, of course. If you go up to Planet Nine and you know measure it, it you're going to be dominated by its by its infrared. Uh, it's going to be hotter in the infrared than than in optical. Um, my understanding for Vera Rubin is that it goes out to about magnitude twenty three and a half, maybe, and um, that is about where our, our models actually kind of fall. They kind of tell you that planet nine might be magnitude 23 or maybe 24. Uh, so for optical, it, it might work. That said, there are other efforts. Um, I forgot the I forgot the name of the telescope, but it, it's basically a effort. It was some cosmological experiment, but but we've uh, you know discussed this with colleagues of using cosmological experiments that indeed look in the in the far uh, IR or, or even microwave to um, you know to try and search for planet nine that way. We know that it's not particularly close because you know Wise didn't find it, and uh, but you know the Wise limits are not particularly. I mean, they're meaningful, but they kind of rule out the most bright, you know, jack-o'-lantern type, uh, you know, Planet Nine out there. So, um, yeah, I mean, no matter what the detection method is, I'll take it. Cool. I, I, I guess this is a good idea. So, thank you very much. So, I, I think this these are all the questions. So, Thiago is also uh, uh, oh, saying so say thank you for the talk. Gustavo too. So, so people really, really like the talk. So you can see lots of comments, uh, very positive comments about not only the talk, but all, all the work that you shared with us today. So you can see there. Well, thank you so much. I, it was, you know, it was really fun to, uh, to take all the questions and present this work and, you know, hopefully we can all meet in real life sometime, you know, sooner than, uh, then uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory comes online. How about that? <laughs> yeah, that's true. So whenever, uh, if you ever have the chance to come to Rio in the future, uh, you are more than welcome to visit us and visit our institute and give a talk. On I'm sure you have lots of interesting updates on this amazing work we've been doing. So, Constantine, uh, I, I will end the broadcast. I'll just make a few announcements, but uh, feel free to, to hang around so we can end the broadcast then later on, on, on yeah. the stream yard. So I would like to thank you very much again for uh, sharing your time and your results with us. Really interesting work with amazing results, very intriguing results, very, lots of results that are really contributing not only to, to what we know, but also raising very interesting questions and making the fields move forward. So thank you very much for this. It was a great talk. And on behalf of Along Observatory, uh, I, I, I'd like to say that I'm very happy that you accept our invitation and thank you for, for being here with us. Thank you, thank you, it's my pleasure. And, and for everyone that was uh, following the talk, thank you very much for, for, the, for the presence. Thank you very much for the very interesting questions too. And uh, don't forget to uh, sign up on our YouTube channel so you can you can receive the notifications of the next talks. You can also check the next talks in our website. There is a very interesting uh, series of talks coming coming on. 
and you can watch the previous talks too, including if you, if you want to go back to this talk from Constantine, it is uh, recorded and it's on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great afternoon, a great week, and see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.